Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. You hear a dentist talking to a patient, Jack Wilson. Four questions, 1 to 12. Complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. How are you today, Mr. Williams? It's good to see you again. I'm doing well, thank you. Just wanting to get this over and done with, if you don't mind me saying so. I'm not very fond of these procedures. I can understand that. Can you tell me when was the last time you had a checkup? Six months ago. All right. How have you been since we last saw you? Is everything okay? Pretty much. Any changes to your general or dental health at all? I'm okay general health-wise. I've recently finished training for a marathon, so I've shed about 10 kilos and I still go to the gym regularly and watch what I eat. The hygienist was very helpful in that regard. She even gave me recipes to follow and I'd love to book in another consultation if she's about today. I'll let her know. Thanks. Even tooth-wise, I'm pretty much okay, I guess. I'm here because I need a whiter smile for work. I'm getting booked more and more for TV work and I'd like to put my best self forward. I have to smile a lot during my interviews and, well, no one wants to see a presenter with stains on their teeth, you know? Congratulations on the lifestyle changes. I know that before your check, you had an x-ray which showed that everything was normal. Just to be on the safe side, I'd like to do one again before we start the procedure, if that's okay. That's fine. So, you said that you're pretty much okay tooth-wise. What's the pretty much part of it? Of late, when I'm brushing my teeth, I find blood in my saliva. It seems to be coming from the two front ones. I don't know what to make of that. Does it hurt at all? No, there's no pain, just blood. Well, it's unlikely that the blood is coming from your teeth, but it's possible that you may have gingivitis. Do you know much about that? That I've been eating too much ginger? No, <laughs> not quite. Bleeding gums are usually caused by plaque buildup. You see, plaque contains germs that attack the healthy tissue surrounding the teeth causing them to become inflamed or irritated. Have you noticed that your gums are particularly swollen? No. How's your breath after you brush? Any lingering bad smells or taste? Not that I've noticed. Okay, good. And it's a good thing you told me about it because at this stage, it's easily treatable and completely reversible. Can you tell me about your brushing and flossing habits? Yes, I brush twice a day. First thing in the morning and last thing at night. Never really got into flossing. I'd really recommend it. You see, your toothbrush can't reach everywhere in your mouth, and even if you have an electric one, it's unlikely to reach between your teeth. That makes flossing the best way to remove any remaining food particles or plaque and to prevent decay and keep gingivitis at bay. I'll bear that in mind. Ask the receptionist to show you our range. We have traditional floss, but also floss picks and holders as well as proxy brushes that have a handle, but are specially designed to clean between your teeth. I will. Thank you. My pleasure. Now, did Amy tell you much about the whitening procedure here? She did, and she also gave me a kick up the bum for not quitting smoking. But I will soon. Well, you certainly can't smoke straight after the procedure. Otherwise, it'll be counterproductive. How long have you been smoking? It'll be six years this month. I've wanted to quit for a while now, I just haven't got the willpower, you know? I'm getting booked more often these days, and the pressure's been ramping up as well, so I'm just stressed. You know? I understand. I managed to quit just before the marathon, so I'm hoping that the price tag on this treatment will motivate me as well. I just need that carrot or stick. I hope so too. All right, let's get to that x-ray and we'll begin.
Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. You hear an occupational therapist talking to a patient called Camden Richardson. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. My name is Perry, madam. Please take a seat, Mrs. Richardson, and give me a moment whilst I finished reading your referral letter. I'm so sorry, but it has only just been delivered. That's okay. Perhaps I could just fill you in. If you wouldn't mind. Not at all. I'm 36 years old this month, and I was diagnosed with lung disease last year. Unfortunately, it was malignant, and the doctor said that it had spread through my body, pretty much all over. I think the word he used was that it had metas... meta... Metastasized? Yes, that's it. Yes, that's what it says here, too. So now, the disease has spread to my calves and thighs and my lower back. I was able to work throughout most of my treatment, through the chemo, too, even when I started to lose my hair. I was still the first one at my desk each morning and the last one to leave at night. My GP cautioned me against it and gave me a sick note so I could take time off, but really, I preferred to keep busy. It's just that now, with everything spreading and I have to use the chair, I don't think I can manage it anymore, at least not without some help. What do you do for work? I'm an administrator for a school, but I've recently had to take leave to deal with all of this. I love my job and really want to go back. It was all manageable, but the main problem is all of the appointments. That's why I had to take the leave. It's not so much the treatment that's wearing me out. It's more having to attend all the appointments. Yes, I can see here that you've recently undergone some radiotherapy. That's right, on the lower part of my spine, and that went really well. That's good news. I hope you're not in too much pain. No, the pain comes and goes. It's more of an ache like a dull ache that I have in the lower back area. I see. Well, my role today will be threefold. Firstly, I'd like to ask you about your home and work life. Then, together, we'll work on pain management and giving you strategies for it, and work on increasing your overall mobility and strength too. Then I'll make some recommendations about adjustments we can make to your home, and some recommendations to your employer about reasonable adjustments that they can make at work. Okay. Can you tell me what home life is like? Do you live with family, friends? I live with my husband, Paul. We've been married for almost a decade now. We chose not to have children, and I'm quite happy with that decision. We have a three-year-old beagle called Petals, though, and sometimes that feels like having a small child. Now with everything that's happening, though, Paul's the one who mainly takes her out for walks and things. Our house is two bedrooms, and we've got a large garden. I can look after her if she wants to go out for some fresh air. We're in the process of installing a ramp so I can do a little bit more for her now. Okay, so you've got a ramp to the garden. What about the stairs? Any adjustments there? Not yet. I've been sleeping downstairs for a little bit. Okay, that's something we'll look into for you. There are some stair lifts that are quite durable and really easy to install, too. Sounds good to me, although I would have to run it by Paul. Make sure he's okay with it. Of course. How about getting into your home? Do you have to navigate any stairs? Not really. It's relatively flat terrain up to the door, and getting into the house is relatively easy with a walker or a lift. That's good to hear. It's a lot brighter in the hallway now that we had spotlights installed. So whilst I'm getting used to everything, I'm not bumping into things as much anymore. We also had some rails installed in the downstairs toilets, which makes life much easier, too. Well, it sounds like you've made quite a few adjustments at home, which is really encouraging. Once the stair lift is fitted, it will make staying at home much more practical. Thank you.
Would you tell me a little bit about what work life is like? Are you on the first floor, second floor? I'm on the third floor of the building. Thankfully, there's a set of lifts, so we're always covered on those days when one breaks down, which is happening more and more these days. Okay. What about the entrance to the school? Is there a ramp that you can use? Yes, there is. That's good news, and I'm sure there are railings along the pathway to help. That is the end of part A. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Question 25. You hear part of a presentation about COPD. Now read the question. The management of COPD includes pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatment. Pharmacologic therapy is very effective. There are different classes of medications available to treat the condition. The mainstay of pharmacologic treatment in patients with COPD is the use of inhaled bronchodilators, like beta-2 agonists and inhaled corticosteroids beta-2 agonists. It can be used alongside inhaled steroids in patients with eosinophilia. There is scant evidence of other practical uses of oral steroids. Other options include phosphodiesterase 4, antibiotics, mucolytics, and alpha-1 antitrypsin augmentation. Non-pharmacologic treatment includes smoking cessation, nicotine replacement, varenicline, bupropion, or nortriptyline, plus avoidance of other risk factors such as occupational dust, air pollutants, Fumes and gases that contribute to airway disease should be emphasized. Self-management interventions include training and self-recognition of exacerbations, coping with breathlessness, increased physical activity and improved nutrition in malnourished individuals, plus palliative care with the aim to optimize quality of life using opiates, fans blowing air onto the face, oxygen, pulmonary rehabilitation, and non-invasive ventilation all reduce breathlessness and fatigue. Question 26. You hear a nurse talking to a patient about her baby. Now read the question. Hi there, how are you? Hi there, I'm not too bad, thank you. Who is this? So this is baby Clara, she's six weeks. Okay, and uh, I believe that you wanted to discuss about vaccinations. Mm. Well, I mean, she's had all that regular testing and that's yeah. come back negative, which is great. But with the vaccinations, I've just decided I don't really want her to have those because I've heard it can cause autism. Right. And um, I'm obviously just a bit concerned about giving her unnecessary medical you know, I see, okay. Injections well, well, what I would say is there's been, you know, there's a lot of hype about this and I do realise that you're, you're concerned. 
but the vaccinations protect against um, lots of childhood diseases, so chicken pox, whooping cough, um, and polio, all sorts of things that you know you don't you don't see nowadays because of these vaccines. Well, I thought they they've still, been eradicated. No, 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 now. they're never they're not eradicated, but we do have preventative ways to help children when they're small and vulnerable. I mean, could, is it not just an option to keep her away from sick people? or It's not really. You can't control them for the environment. You know, mm. as she gets older and um, is a toddler, you know, she, you can't control. So it is better to vaccinate her when she is younger. Okay. It does make sense. Question 27. You hear part of an interview with a specialist about autonomous Hepatitis. Now read the question. There are two types of autoimmune hepatitis based on serum tests. Type 1 is more common, tends to affect young women and is associated with other autoimmune diseases. This is the most common form of the condition. Type 2 primarily affects girls between the ages of 2 and 14. While autoimmune hepatitis generally occurs in adolescence or early adulthood, it can develop at any age. Symptoms of autoimmune hepatitis range from mild to severe. In the early stages, you may have no symptoms, but in later stages, symptoms can appear suddenly. They may also slowly develop over time. Autoimmune hepatitis symptoms include enlarged liver, hepatomegaly, abnormal blood vessels on the skin, spider angiomas, abdominal distension, swelling, dark urine, pale coloured stools. Question 28. You hear a dentist consulting a patient. Now read the question. So, what makes you think your daughter needs braces? Her top two teeth are starting to protrude, giving her what I think are called buck teeth. It's rather strange because my teeth look completely different. See, they're rather small and a little on the sharper side. One thing's for sure, she definitely has her father's teeth. How old is your daughter? Almost 11, and if I'm honest, I am a little hesitant to be carrying out a procedure unless it's absolutely necessary. From what I've read though, adult teeth are pretty hard to reshape and I'd rather we take corrective action now than regret it in the future. Well, lots of children wear braces. On the pros side, braces will certainly fix the issue. They work by applying pressure on the teeth over a period of time so that the bones can reshape. On the cons side, however, braces can be quite difficult to clean. But I presume you can help your daughter keep track of that. Yes, I can. Thank you very much for the suggestion. Are there less conspicuous braces than the metal ones? I guess I'm just worried about what the other children at school might say. I wouldn't worry about that. In fact, there's a handy leaflet that explains how to introduce braces to your child, and it gives examples and case studies that I think would be helpful. For Question 29. You hear part of a presentation about asthma. Now read the question. Asthma can be classified into four different groups according to the cause. 1. Atopic asthma is the most common and classic type. In this case, there is usually a medical history of allergies or family history of atopic asthma. 2. Non-atopic asthma. This type is caused by respiratory infections in patients without a family history of asthma. 3. 
drug-induced asthma. This type is defined as asthma induced by different types of medications, like aspirin or other types of non-steroidal drugs. 4. Occupational asthma. This form is induced by small quantities of chemicals and there is usually a history of repeated exposure. Several precipitant factors are being studied related to the development of an asthma attack such as viral infections, domestic allergens, occupational allergens, tobacco smoke, exercise, and stress. The diagnosis of asthma should be confirmed before the start of treatment. The features used for an accurate diagnosis are a history of variable respiratory symptoms like a wheeze, shortness of breath, chest tightness, and cough, often triggered by physical exercise, laughter, allergens, or cold air. Question 30. You hear doctors discussing an episode of a TV show. Now read the question. Did you catch Bowlby last night? Yeah, I know. It was really embarrassing, wasn't it? Yeah. Did get it right? They had that man with dementia yeah. and I, I thought they were treating him terribly. He looked so scared. They had everyone crowding around at him, telling him to calm down, calm down, and just went... Like, I mean, the last thing that you need when he's clearly confused... Yeah. Imagine yourself in that situation. You're just going to be in a room not knowing suddenly who you are, where you are, and you've got all these strangers just screaming in your face to calm down. Yeah. It's awful. It really mm. is. Um, I mean... <laughs> They should have done something else, anything else. How would you usually deal with a dementia patient? I mean, definitely not approach like six or seven people around the mm. bed. You need to be quiet and get them to calm down. Mm. Definitely offer them some water and just reassure them that everything's going to be okay. And even if you just can get them to rest or to sit down, because if they're in that state, yeah. they're usually really hyper. And, I think you know, guide them to where you want them to be as well. Exactly, Don't force yeah. them. The last thing you need is someone, you know, grabbing you by your arm. Because then they'll get aggressive. quite aggressive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, know, you just need someone in that situation to be friendly to you, to someone you feel like you can trust, because in that moment, you, you don't know who to trust. Exactly, yeah. That is the end of part B. Now, look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear a healthcare practitioner talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose answer A, B or C, which you think Best fits according to the text. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear obstetrician Jessica Radisson delivering a talk on the neutral cord. Now read the question. You now have 90 seconds.
Hello, my name is Jessica Radisson, and the question I hope to answer today is, what effect does a nuchal cord have on your baby? Firstly, what is a nuchal cord? Medical professionals use the term nuchal cord to describe a condition where the umbilical cord is wrapped around the neck of the baby. This takes place during labor, pregnancy, or birth. You see, your baby's life is highly dependent on the umbilical cord. It is the path through which blood, oxygen, and nutrients are supplied to the baby. If the umbilical cord is diseased or infected or damaged in some way, then the health of your baby will be at risk. However, most nuchal cords are not dangerous. A nuchal cord is a common occurrence. Studies have shown that at least one in three babies are born perfectly with the cord wrapped around their neck. The causes of a nuchal cord. Pregnant women understand that babies move a lot in the womb. This isn't strange to them. A nuchal cord is mostly caused by the acrobatic movements that the baby does while in the womb. However, other factors may also contribute to the occurrence of a nuchal cord. The Wharton's jelly is responsible for the protection of the healthy umbilical cords. The Wharton's jelly is a gelatinous soft filling. It prevents the formation of knots in the cord so that the fetus will stay safe irrespective of how much it flips around or wriggles. Some umbilical cords are deficient in the Wharton's jelly. This increases the risk of a nuchal cord. A nuchal cord is also imminent if the woman has a multiple pregnancy, twins, there is too much of the amniotic fluid, the cord is too long, the cord structure, anatomy, is abnormal. Actually, a nuchal cord cannot be avoided and they are not caused by the mother. In many cases, a nuchal cord poses no risk to the baby. If you have one, you will probably not hear any mention of it during the baby's birth, except in the case of a complication. The cord may wrap around the baby's neck multiple times and the baby will still be completely fine. Studies have shown that at least 1 in 2,000 births will have an actual knot in the cord. In this case, there are risks associated with it. However, even in such cases, it is rare for the cord to tighten to dangerous extents. The baby's life is placed on the line when the nuchal cord cuts off the flow of blood to the baby. So you may be wondering how you can spot a nuchal cord as it does not have any obvious symptoms. The mother will not notice any changes in her body or her pregnancy symptoms. It is very difficult for a mother to guess whether or not her baby has a nuchal cord. This offers no help with diagnosis of its occurrence. In fact, the only way to diagnose a nuchal cord is via an ultrasound. Even then, it may be pretty difficult to detect. Also, the ultrasound can only identify the nuchal cord. Healthcare professionals cannot determine from an ultrasound the risk posed by the nuchal cord to your baby. If you receive an early diagnosis of a nuchal cord, then it is important that you do not panic. The cord may unravel before it's time to deliver the baby. If it does not, you still have high chances of giving birth safely to your baby. If your doctor discovers during labor that you have a potential nuchal cord, then he or she will monitor you closely so they can act immediately if the baby develops complications. How do you manage a nuchal cord? There is no way to treat or prevent a nuchal cord. You cannot do anything about it until delivery. Healthcare professionals usually inspect all babies born for the nuchal cord. If they discover any, all they do is gently slip it off the neck so that it doesn't tighten the baby's neck once it has started to breathe. If the nuchal cord is diagnosed at pregnancy, there is nothing to be done. Your doctor will not suggest emergency delivery of the baby. Nuchal cord complications arise in very rare cases. Pregnant women are advised to watch their stress levels. Discuss all concerns you may have with your doctor so that he or she can help ease your mind. Complications associated with the nuchal cord arises mostly during labor. Uterine contractions can cause compression of the umbilical cord. This drastically reduces the amount of blood supply to the baby. This may also result in a decrease in the baby's heart rate. With proper observation and monitoring, your medical team will discover this issue, and in many cases, the baby will be born without any complications. However, if the baby's heart rate continues to drop, then an emergency cesarean delivery may be required. In very rare cases, a nuchal cord may cause a decrease in the fetal movement decreased development if it happens early in the pregnancy, or a more complex delivery.
Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear an interview with Dr. Bruce Arnott discussing his work on aspergillosis. Now read the question. You now have 90 seconds. Welcome to the Health Matters Podcast. Joining me today is Dr. Bruce Arnott, joining us all the way from San Francisco. Welcome to London, Dr. Arnott. It's a pleasure to have you on today's podcast. Thank you. It's great to be over on this side of the pond for a change. <laughs> so one of your specialties is infections, particularly ones caused by various fungi. Right. Today I'll be talking about aspergillosis, which is an infection caused by a type of mold. The illnesses resulting from aspergillosis usually affects the respiratory system, but their signs and severity vary greatly. What causes it, and how can someone know that they've got it? The mold that triggers the illnesses, aspergillus, is everywhere, indoors and outdoors. Most strains of this mold are harmless, but a few can cause serious illnesses when people with weakened immune systems, underlying lung disease, or asthma inhale their spores. In some people, the spores trigger an allergic reaction. Other people develop mild to serious lung infections. The most serious form of aspergillosis, invasive aspergillosis, occurs when the infection spreads to blood vessels and beyond. To answer your second question, the signs and symptoms of aspergillosis vary with the type of illness you develop. Symptoms include an allergic reaction. So, some people with asthma or cystic fibrosis have an allergic reaction to aspergillus. Signs and symptoms of this condition, known as allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, include fever, a cough that may bring up blood or plugs of mucus, worsening asthma. I should point out, though, that aspergillosis is not contagious from person to person. Are some people more at risk of getting it than others? That's a good question, and the short answer is yes. Your risk of developing aspergillosis depends on your overall health and the extent of your exposure to mold. In general, these factors make you more vulnerable to aspergillosis. Weakened immune system. People taking immune-suppressing drugs after undergoing transplant surgery, especially bone marrow or stem cell transplants, or people who have certain cancers of the blood, are at highest risk of invasive aspergillosis. People in the later stages of AIDS also may be at increased risk. Low white blood cell level. People who have had chemotherapy, an organ transplant, or leukemia have lower white cell levels, making them more susceptible to invasive aspergillosis. So does having chronic granulatomous disease, an inherited disorder that affects immune system cells. Lung cavities. People who have air spaces or cavities in their lungs are at a higher risk of developing aspergillomas. Asthma or cystic fibrosis. People with asthma or cystic fibrosis, especially those whose lung problems are long-standing or hard to control, are more likely to have an allergic response to aspergillus mold. Long-term corticosteroid therapy. Long-term use of corticosteroids may increase the risk of aspergillosis and similar infections 
depending on the underlying disease being treated and what other drugs are being used. I think it's a lot more serious than I first thought when I heard of the condition. That's true. Depending on the type of infection, aspergillosis can cause a variety of serious complications, for example, bleeding. Both aspergillomas and invasive aspergillosis can cause severe bleeding in your lungs. Systemic infection is another. The most serious complication of invasive aspergillosis is the spread of the infection to other parts of your body, especially your brain, heart, and kidneys. Invasive aspergillosis spreads rapidly and may be fatal. Is there a cure? Like with anything, prevention is better than cure. In fact, it's nearly impossible to avoid exposure to aspergillus, but if you have had a transplant or are undergoing chemotherapy, try to stay away from places where you're likely to encounter mold, such as construction sites, compost piles, and buildings that store grain. If you have a weakened immune system, your doctor may advise you to wear a face mask to avoid being exposed to aspergillus and other airborne infectious agents. Aspergilloma requires surgery. An invasive pulmonary aspergillus would need an antifungal medicine directly into a vein. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your work.